before we start that you're all uh, on mute uh, when the speaker um, especially is presenting and uh, we will have time for questions towards the end. And um, I'll start the session right now. So welcome everyone. Um, we're really happy to have our guest speaker here, Ted Brawl, who will uh, introduce us into uh, the topic of sociocracy, um, navigating sociocracy um, for a different um, kind of uh, situations. And uh, we will also um, briefly introduce the team. So um, this session is hosted by the SI Systems Innovation Organizations Hub. And um, we have a small team here. And what we do is we aim to bring people together around uh, new ideas of managing within organizations and also hope to create awareness around um, systems innovation approaches. And um, Yes, if you uh, wish to join our hub, then you may definitely do so. I shall send a link later after the session into the chat. Um, but I don't want to continue uh, talking about me anymore, really. I want to introduce you to our hub, uh, to our speaker today, Ted Braw, who um, founded or is a co-founder of Sociocracy for All and is also the author of um, Collective Power, and we will hear a lot from him today. Um, but before we dive into um, his presentation, where I just want to uh, sense in this room, um, how familiar are you with sociocratic approaches? Um, if you could write the scale from zero to 10 in the chat, um, that would be very great just to see who's in the room. Uh, are you currently beginning to learn uh, about these approaches? Are you beginning to apply or are you quite experienced in ap applying these approaches? That would be great. So we have people that are learning, applying, seven, a six, so familiar and starting to apply and someone who's very experienced in these approaches. Great, wonderful. So I will hand it over to Ted Raw. Thank you very much for joining Ted Raw. Thank you, Anya. Um, yeah, my name is Ted, I am Right now in Massachusetts, that's where I live. Um, I am from Germany in case some people get distracted by trying to guess where somebody's from. That's 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 the accent. Um, yeah, my path to sociocracy um, was was very indirect and one of those serendipities. Um, I I uh, was I finished my PhD in uh, linguistics, uh, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, interfaces in Germany. And then I came to the US and then I decided to stay in the US because of other reasons. And basically that mean, meant leaving behind my career in academia, um, mostly because of family reasons, all of that. And then I moved also because of family, I moved into an intentional community. So a community with 70 people sharing a big community building and each living in one of 32 houses. And this community was and is still run sociocratically. So that was my first contact with it. And I remembered in the beginning, I was unimpressed because who cares about governance? I didn't. And, um, but something about the meetings was different. And then I was beginning to be curious of, wait, how does this work? And how is this different from the things that I have experienced in other organizations? So, I started out, like many people that I talked to, though I'm guessing that the density of these people is lower in this room than the usual, because often what I need to do is just point out that governance is a thing because so many people are blind to systems, right? They don't even see systems. And then, and I know that's not, the, not true here, but what I explain about governance is, well, yes, governance sounds not so super exciting at first until you imagine that you have a bunch of people that you want to do things with and you have a project you want to do 
And governance is the thing that connects you to the people and connects you to the work and the tasks with the tasks and all of that. And all of a sudden it becomes something that is not abstract and far away, but something that is really, really close to how we see ourselves, how we relate to others and the kind of work that we want to do. And to me, therefore, governance is one of the most exciting things. Now, one interesting thing about, so let me take a little detour about organizations and where decisions are made. In hierarchical situations, typically the decisions are made somewhere further towards the top and the work is done somewhere further below, right? The managers say what should be done and then the workers do it. And it's that distinction that somehow started and in sociocracy, we try to bring those two back together again. And that is really what the word means, sociocracy. You might have guessed that, socio like sociology, cracy like democracy. It's those who associate together, govern. And if I'm pressed and I'm at a party and I have you know 30 seconds to explain it, I say, those who do stuff together decide together. It's only half right, it's super reductionist, but it gives people a little bit of a way in. Ooh, okay. Now, it all starts with what we call a circle. It's a team of people. And this team does work, makes decisions about the work, and organizes itself. It's like a cell that is self-organized. And in order to really understand that we need two, there, there, there are three pieces of jargon I need to explain sociocracy, and those are the first two. It is, the aim is a description of what the circle does. It's more tangible even, or can be something like purpose, but it typically is very tangible of, this is the agreement on, this is what we're coming together to do. Could be something like teaching sociocracy, um, building houses, publishing websites, you know, like something fairly tangible. And the domain is the area of decision-making that this circle has. So that is what they can make decisions about. That is all easy when it's only one team. Of course, they're doing it, they're making decisions, all is easy. It gets more complicated when we have more than one team. So let's look at the same situation with more than one team, let's say with three teams. And you see here, I use the same things again here. Again, this team has its own work, has its own decision-making, organizes itself. Now, if you look at just this image and you imagine this is an organization with the people that you see, and often an example that I like doing is something like a community garden, just because everybody understands gardening. Like I know very little about gardening, but there's so much I can understand. And let's say this is a group of people running a community garden together and all the people that you see are the people who are involved in making the decisions and the doing. Now, let's imagine that these are the people that take care of the plants. These are the people that take care of the infrastructure, like for example, fences and hoses and tools and the tool shed. And these people are the people people. That's people circle. They do everything that has to do with um, onboarding new members, sending out reminders about the workday, organizing childcare for the workday, that kind of thing. Conflict resolution maybe. And now what's really important to understand sociocracy is the following. Imagine these three circles and see how all the operations and all the decisions of this organization now get done because they all have a place where they're being done. Everything that you could possibly imagine that needs to be done in this organization on an operational side is being done and everything that needs to be decided for that is being decided. So the operational part of the organization is complete, but that's not a complete system yet. What we need is 
also some sort of coordination between them. But we want the coordination to be very well connected with the operations. And how we do that is, and I want you to appreciate it was a lot of Photoshopping effort. So please notice that this is that person. This is this person. This is this person. <laughs> you get the idea. Two people from each circle are forming what we call the general circle. And as you can imagine, the general circle is doing the coordination of, hey, well, how are things going over, over in that circle? Oh, you're, you know, like you're struggling with harvesting today. Maybe we should see if we can get some more, some more members. Um, yes, things like that, okay? So coordination. But the important thing here is that the general circle ideally does not make the decisions for the circles. The decisions are still being made here. Here's just where we make sure it all fits together. So the general circle, that's one of the three functions has as first function coordination across the organization. Second one is support, peer support. If everybody here is involved in deep drama, as sometimes organizations or teams are, the two of them, or at least one of them, should have a place to go and say, I don't know what to do with my team. Like, can you help me think this through? And the neat thing about this is it's not like going to your boss because it's going like to your peers. All these people are in exactly the same position as you are. So it should be a safe space where you can bring these things up. The third function of the general circle is to make decisions about the aims and domains of the circles. So in a way, the general circle is the circle that decides who decides. So let me explain that. Let's say somebody comes to the general circle or somebody has the idea of we should be doing grant writing. Nobody's doing grant writing in the organization. Like they're not doing it, they're busy planting. They're, do they're busy repairing and building things and they're busy doing the people stuff. Who's doing the grant writing? And maybe that person has the idea of, hey, if we got some grants, we could be giving free memberships to people who need it and so on. And now by default, because there is no other obvious place, if there is an obvious place, you go directly there. Like if you have complaints about the tomatoes, here's where you go. If you have complaints about the membership list or the childcare, here's where you go. But if something doesn't have a place like the grant writing and it's not in anybody's aim or domain, you go to the general circle. And now the general circle needs to figure out, okay, so what do we do with that now? Do we want to do grant writing? And let's say they say, oh yeah, absolutely, we should do that. And then now they try to find a place to put it. And they look at this circle and go, hey, how about besides planting and harvesting things to also do grant writing? It's like, that ah, seems like an odd mix. So let's not do that. How about infrastructure? Grant writing is like infrastructure, right? But they say, oh no, but we build things. This is about physical things. This is not this kind of infrastructure. Doesn't, it's not our domain, doesn't mix with ours. And now we go to people circle and say, hey, while you're doing membership lists and all of that, maybe they also do the finances somehow. How about you also do grant writing? Because they write the text for the website to invite new members. That's almost like writing to a funder, right? So you're, you're almost halfway there. And now, the proposal would be to add grant writing to the aim of this circle, which is a decision that would be made here. Now, it becomes really important that those two people are here because we, this is not some kind of steering committee that can just dump something onto a circle. Because this decision of adding grant writing to people's circles aim and domain is made by consent. So, and that I will say more about, but for now what it means is if one of those two, just one of them says no, it's a no. So in this combination of consent and what we call linking, the fact that we have those people, those actual people sitting here, we now have created a system of power balance between two circles because this circle cannot overpower that circle without consent of the bridge people, the linking people, creating power balance. So 
Later, I will also talk about consent balancing power between individuals, but the combination with the structure of balances between groups. Now, it could be then that they walk that through and say, hey, how about we give you two extra people? Are you willing to do grant writing now? And they say, sure, now it's possible. Or they say, no, it's not possible. And then we have to figure out whether we still want to do it or whatever else. There are a zillion different options here. The point is it can be figured out in mutual consent. Okay. So, and now it could also be that there's conflict between two circles. My very ridiculous example, and I, again, that's why you will see how I know nothing about gardening. Let's say they build, they plan some kind of plants that somehow need special equipment that is really hard to take care of or gets wrecked in the process or something. And now the infrastructure circle is upset with plants circle for planting these plants without checking in with them. And now they have to figure out like, wait, who has anybody overstepped their domain here? And if they can't figure it out directly, this is the place where it gets resolved. So bumping it one level up is always a way to resolve something as equals again. Okay. We also need to make this a complete system. And I'm thinking here a little bit like viable systems model, for example, looks at things. There are also some of the other um, functions in the system that are more long-term thinking, more kind of who holds the identity and makes the overarching things. And that is really like, uh, like an advisory board, the mission circle. I'm sorry, I lost my Um, hmm. it is gone okay uh, so the mission circle again gives advice and you see it's also again has this double connection to the general circle because we want operations to influence the long-term thinking and the long-term thinking to influence operations and those two people here are full decision makers here so same applies as everywhere else. If a decision is made here, for example, about changing the aim of the organization, those two people can object. And that is the basic setup. That's kind of the minimum requirement. I mean, in a way one can in theory do without a mission circle, but not for long, because the gaps in, in lack of long-term thinking typically show after a while. But this is kind of the minimum minimum structure. You can have two circles, three, four circles, something like that. But it looks like this. One other thing that we can do is, though, is we can kind of butt out more circles. Like, for example, we can form subcircles here. I just want to talk for a moment about how that works so that you really get the fractal nature of it. So let's say, so this was uh, an infrastructure circle. So dealing with tools and hoses and fences and so on. Now, let's say they find that all the talking about tools in the tool shed gets a little bit too much here. Plus, it's really three people anyway, only that take care of this. So how about they form a subcircle for the tool shed and the tools and put whoever is interested in that over here? And that could also be people who are not here, new people. And now they hand over the aim and the domain of the tool shed and the tools to the tool shed or the tools circle. So now if a decision needs to be made about the shovels, it's this circle deciding, not this circle. And in fact, even this circle cannot override the tools circle on decisions in the tool circles domain. So this leads to a system where everything is somewhere and we have a way to change what is where but that gives us the clarity to really hand over the um, decision-making authority to small groups somewhere in the system which are, um, who are then very able to make very responsive decisions very fast. Because again, if you have a problem with childcare, you go here and they are the people doing it, they are the people deciding it, you're gonna get help instantly. You don't have to go through all the instances and talk to the boss and the boss's boss and the boss's boss till you reach a decision. And changing aims and domains is relatively rare. This is not something that happens every week, but also not something that happens every five years. It's somewhere in between. Okay, if you have questions about that, hold them for a moment because I'm gonna go through it and then we'll gather all the questions. 
this is another way of looking at a sociocratic structure. It's basically what you just saw, just drawn a little differently. And people really connect to this um, image. It's from one of our books, Many Voices, One Song. Um, and people really like it. So what you see here is you have these links. So one person is what we call the bottom up link in this case, that would be the delegate. So a person that is a decision maker here, but also then gets sent to this circle to be a decision maker there and reports bottom up. And then the other person is the leader of this circle, gets sent top down, brings information from there, brings it here so that everybody knows what's happening in the wider organization. And it leads to a pattern that you see here. Of course, there are many more cross connections, but at the very, very least, every circle has kind of an influx and, in, like, and, and information flowing out of that circle. So everybody is always reporting to somebody. And one even really cool thing about this is that if you look at the dotted line that I drew, and you imagine it's a rubber band, you can see that if you pulled it out with your hands and your mind, you would see that it's one big circle. Do you see that, the dotted line? Okay. So in a way, it's decision-making by everybody as equals and, and together, but we can't make high quality decisions in a group of a hundred people. That's why we take some of it, we pinch it in, but we leave the connection open here. We make sure that there's no bottleneck of just one person that then is in the sandwich position. The two of them, that's a fairly crucial part of it so that they don't end up in this, in this weird position. If you have two people, it completely changes that dynamic. All right, time check, good. Uh, there are internal roles also, which the two of them we already know, leader and delegate. Everybody, every team should have a facilitator and a secretary. Note-taking, by the way, becomes more relevant now because it might be that some circle somewhere makes a decision that actually affects me, right? Like let's say in my community, if the garden circle changes the fee for private plots in the garden, it might be that all of a sudden my fee goes up and they decided that. And I want, let's say I'm upset about it. First thing I want to do is look at their notes and see if I can make sense of it and whether that gives me more information. So note-taking in this decentralized system is one of the ways of creating kind of a common ground of information. And then we can also cluster operational roles. Like for example, I hold the roles, actually you don't see that right now, but I'm surrounded by some of our books that we sell. So I'm the one doing the fulfillment of that. So that's an operational role. It's not something about the process. It's just something that needs doing. And those can just be defined wherever we need them. And then they're filled typically by consent. This picture I chose, because to me, it's, it's the best picture ever that I found that really expresses to me what meetings feel like in the sociocratic way. And I said in the beginning, when I first was exposed to sociocracy, it was the meetings that really left an impression on me. And I had this moment that was a little bit of my waking up to all of this governance stuff, because I always thought meetings are just the way they are. I didn't think of them as anything you could improve. I, it was just not on my radar at all. And maybe you know this feeling that sometimes you say something out loud and in that moment you're like, yeah. Right, I just said something that I wasn't so aware of actually. And what I heard myself say was, I after, so at, in that meeting, very early in like, there must have been in 2012, um, in this community, I was asked what was this meeting like at the end of the meeting. And I heard myself say, I'm leaving this meeting more refreshed and feeling more connected and more inspired or something than when I came. And I thought to myself, wait, this never happened with a meeting. Typically, I leave drained and frustrated. That's typically what happens for me. Because typically, everything is slow and a lot of words. And like, actually, I just, yeah. But that's that was not my experience. I was like, wait, what's different now? And one of the key things, that's one of the flagship things that many of you will know if, you, if you've had some exposure, which I know some of you have had. One of them is a simple circle practice of doing rounds. So instead of just talking, whoever is feeling like talking, we go around to make sure that we hear everybody. 
And what that means, just to walk you through real quick, is let's say this person is the facilitator. And let's say somebody just had a new idea. The facilitator might say, okay, let's look what people think about this idea. Let's do a round. And they typically will start not right with them or like next to them. That's a little bit of a practice that helps, it makes it easier later. So let's say they start here. So facilitator says, how about you say your reaction to this idea that was just stated? Now this person says their idea, this person, this person, mm -hmm. we go around. This person speaks as a member of the group. You don't have to only be facilitator. You're also entitled to your own voice. This person speaks, this person speaks. Round is complete. Now the facilitator might either do a second round if they feel like um, there was something building and maybe new information got shared later in the round and now we want to tie other people in again. Or maybe we've heard enough and it's a minor issue and we might move to a decision and the facilitator will now say, okay, now based on this idea and the reactions, I'm now going to formally, pro formally propose dot, dot, dot. Or they might say, okay, I'm hearing several things here. Let's put them on the backlog for a future meeting. So whatever the different patterns that we use about how we manage the explorations and the decisions that need to be made. But my main point here is about rounds, that typically that's the most basic pattern of talking about anything is in rounds so that everybody's voice is heard, which in the beginning sounds slow, but it is a kind of front loading where you create the clarity and the togetherness that helps you in the long run. And I find that if we do the back and forth because somebody gets upset or whatever, we typically lose time. So back and forth is not necessarily faster. Now let's say it is time to make decisions. We all know the decision-making method of somebody decides, like the boss or mom. The problem about that, as we all somewhat know, is that it's fast, but there's so many voices that are not heard. One voice gets heard, the other ones maybe not. In majority vote, half or slightly over, like above the half of the voices get heard, the rest can be ignored. In consensus, which is a decision-making method that says something like everybody has to agree, everybody is heard. And I made a little passive aggressive sliver in here because I hardly know any groups that operate by consensus. Most of them operate by modified consensus. And what that means is that often they have a rule like consensus minus one, that one person might be against something and they still move forward. Now, the decision-making method that is used in, in sociocracy is closest to consensus, but there are some differences to it. So let's look at this. Let me actually open them all really quick. So in consent, instead of asking, do you agree? We ask, do you object? And why is that different? If I ask, do you agree? People will typically think about, well, do I agree? Is that what I want? Is that what I think is the best thing? And they will respond with a preference. A very simple example, and sadly a true story that I tell from time to time is, I remember a few years ago, I asked, I invited my kids um, for lunch in town. So we stood in the middle of town on Main Street next to the library. And I asked them, what do you want for lunch? was the biggest mistake because now I had set the expectation to what is it that you want? Had I instead asked, hey, I know you all like burritos. Is there any reason, like is there anybody who's against burritos? What's the difference? Let's imagine I'm the kid that wanted pizza. Pizza is my preference. If I'm being asked, do you want, like, what do you want for lunch? Or do you want burritos? I would say, no, I want pizza. So it's a no for burritos, okay? If I'm being asked, 
is there anything wrong with or anything, you know, against burritos? I would say, well, I wanted pizza, but there's nothing wrong with burritos. Like, it's not that I say absolutely no. So fine, let's have burritos. So flipping the question from what do you want to is there anything wrong gives us this extra part to play with that we call the range of tolerance, where you say that's not my preference, but there's also nothing wrong with it. So it's a yes. So back then, when I was at the middle of town, had I asked, is burritos okay? Or is there anything, anybody have anything against burritos? Most likely we would have had lunch, lunch that day. The truth of the story is we did not have lunch that day because one kid threw themselves on the ground and was throwing a tantrum. Then everybody was upset and there was no lunch in town that day. So what I'm saying here is this really matters. Like this is why groups struggle. And it can lead to non-decisions, which of course in the long run is super harmful. Now, one cool thing about all this is that we have a clear definition of what an objection is. It means if we decide this, like if we have burritos, there's something wrong with it in the context of what we're trying to do together. So it's typically evaluated against the aim of the thing that we're doing in the circle or in the organization. So let's say, for example, um, we are publishing an online magazine about, I don't know, social justice. And somebody says, enough with this online magazine, let's go march and occupy this or that for two weeks. Uh, somebody should probably object and say, well, our aim is that we're gonna publish a magazine. I can't, cannot see us occupying something for weeks and publishing it, so no. And they might still change their aim, they can do that. But what the objection consent process does, it, it highlights when you're getting off track. You can decide to go off track or to change your track, but the you know, objection is really designed to surface when something is not aligned with previous agreements. Uh, one important thing is that if one person in the circle objects, it doesn't move forward. We need to do more work. Like I said earlier when the grant writing, you know, you need to figure it out still. But people from outside of the circle cannot object. So you do not need to make 100 people happy. You just need to get your circle to not object. That lowers the bar enough that most decisions are made fairly easily. And if somebody doesn't have an objection, that's great because then that person just found a gap in what we were thinking and helps us steer closer to our previous agreements or be more explicit about it. The consent process, which I'm not gonna go through it now, but um, has a, is clearly outlined of how do you ask for consent? There's a clear three-step process and also clear what happens if there is an objection. It's all very much laid out and easy to learn. The other processes, like for example, the meeting format is clearly um, laid out and it becomes a little bit like a dance. Everybody knows exactly what the basic steps are and then you're ready to dance without having to talk about it. It's fairly robust and it can be varied. As, it has a lot of flexibility in it while still being very clear. So one of the jokes that we make is that in a sociocratic meeting, the facilitator can you know, faint and the meeting can just continue because it's so obvious what the next thing is because of all the basic, basic underlying patterns. We also select people into roles by consent, which is also a beautiful process. And we do performance reviews to give people feedback on how they can be better uh, peers in the work. So all of those follow certain patterns that are, take a little bit longer to see. That's something I get a little nerdy about, but not now. Okay, home stretch here. Who uses sociocracy? Um, it's often... Oh, it's very, no, let me say it like this. It is, there's a lot of variety in it. The, there are several sectors that over the last few years have moved from this is a brand new idea to people to now it's basically normal. Like for example, intentional communities. 10 years ago, my community was an outlier and now basically new forming groups adopt sociocracy very early in the process. It's kind of one of the most common systems used. 
Then nonprofits. Is nonprofits are something that we're looking at as a sector because there's um, all this move towards kind of more member-run organizations, more um, more worker-run. So sociocracy is a great system for that. This is a nonprofit uh, that teaches mindfulness that has adopted sociocracy. And you see this looks slightly different just visually, but the patterns are all the same, right? Circle, sub-circle, blah, 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 mission circle that they call whatever they want to call it double linking, sub-circles, all of that. This is a school. Let's see, what else? This is a complex organization, but a fascinating one that I worked with in Canada, um, doing kind of advocacy work and they sit between the city and the citizens. This is a worker co-op making bread. This is an old picture of my own organization with about 240 people, most of them volunteers, about 30 people in paid roles in like something like a seven people full-time equivalent. And this is an old structure of ours. It's changed a little. This is a um, software company. Again, very simple, all the same principles that you already know. General circle, the thing that they do, long-term steering, sub-circles as needed. Double linked, end of story. That's really how, that's the basic pattern. There's some books that have been mentioned, Many Voices, One Song is the, um, is the reference of actually becoming like the reference manual for sociocracy. In 2018, we wrote that, my colleague and I. This is about how to start a group, like how do you start even the first, the first thing that you do. This is for a group that is just launching. This is for children, and this is the book that actually led to this contact. Um, collective power is more about the general patterns. So if you're not a practitioner, but you're interested in governance patterns, <clears throat> this one describes all of those. And then some more introductory stuff. And that's it. So I'm gonna look at questions now. Um, great. So um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, shall I start from the very top? Um, sure. So uh, we would love to hear a perspective on sociocracy versus holacracy. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So um, just historically, uh, holacracy was built on sociocracy. If you know them both, you can see that there's a ton of overlap. Um, that just has historical reasons. So there are two things. One can be of two minds about this, and I'm just going to tell you both sides. One side, and that's more where I sit, say that holacracy is basically a specification of sociocracy. So for example, in sociocracy, like I showed you the meeting format, but if you want to override it and by consent decide to use a different meeting format, you're free to do it. It's a free and open system. It's not owned. It's just you do whatever you do. And you stay within the system by consenting to your own to your own rules. So consent is basically like um, that you can't touch. Um, Holacracy has its own templates for meetings, for several different kinds of meetings and so on. And they are the way they are. Like if you want to do holacracy, that's what you do. So in a way, sociocracy contains holacracy because it's just a more specific version of it. Yeah. But there are other things that you could do, and sociocracy is is kind of has that flexibility. So in a way, there's no issue because it's just a choice of specifying some of the things. They have two little things sometimes not so little, that have been changed from sociocracy, where I sometimes have a little bit of like, ooh, that's just kind of more put into a more hierarchical context. Um, if you're curious about that, I have some comparison articles that, that spell those out. Um, yeah, but really for me, it's all, it's all a lot, like within the bell curve of these circle-based, role-based, consent-based systems. Great. Um, I'll go to the next uh, question. So we kind of um, saw the slides already, but I'll just read it. Um, what would you say is the minimal organization size to implement sociocracy? Um, so um, this Beth uh, it has an organization of 10 uh, thinking to work this way, but some things seem a bit overstructured. In addition to that, Meta asked, um, 
um is there a minimum is there a maximum size yes um to be very honest 10 is a little bit of a tricky size i don't say i'm not saying it's impossible at all and you would get a lot of out of the decision making the roles the meeting format on the structural side it depends on how much task interdependence you have if there's not a lot then it would almost be easier to just have one circle but if there is a lot of differentiation then it would be useful um, I'm going to put in the chat a an article on sociocracy in small groups that spells out different ways of, well, if you know, if you have a lot of interdependence, how could you do it? If, yeah, it depends on the internal structure of it, really, very much. So you can look at that. That should answer it. The one funky thing is, and that's kind of what you're alluding to, is that you have to add structure to have the clarity. And with 10 people, you know, you can almost wing a few things. Um, that said, it depends on whether you want to grow or not. If you if you don't project to grow, I would look at roles, decision making, meetings, and so on, and and work with that. Yeah, I'll stop there. Great. The article is in the chat. Thank you. Uh, then I'll go to the third question. Um, how do you deal with opinions from people who are uh, uninformed or not understanding the material? Uh, well, one, and I see Sanjay's comment on that one too. Well, here's the thing. Remember that those who are not in the circle cannot object. Okay. So now, okay, let's do a concrete example. Let's say, oh, I have a good, I have a good example for you, a very real one. Um, we recently internally in our organization changed the pay structure, like what a, by, by like how a salary is determined. And that was a decision that came out of a circle called financial well-being, so finance circle. And there were several considerations about this, having to do with bookkeeping and, you know, like um, payroll, like how do you make this as simple and as fair as possible? And we got feedback. So that's another thing that it didn't say. While the circle had the authority to make this decision, we did get feedback from everybody to ask like, here's the thing we're wanting to change, give us feedback. So they were heard already. And then we made a decision in the circle. Somebody from outside of finance circle cannot object to it. And everybody inside the circle, that was a, was a group of four or five people that had been working on this together for a while already. So because of how decisions are made in small groups, it hardly ever happens that people who have consent rights are uninformed because it's literally the circles that do the things also that decide, you know, and you should not even have somebody on the circle who is not related to the work that you do. That is actually when I work as a consultant with organizations, that's typically one of the first thing I notice, especially in volunteer run organizations. It's kind of the, the more the merrier kind of approach that I think completely backfires on organizations because you invite people into a working group that are not actually working. They just have opinions. But opinions are typically only informed by what's in the head and not really in the lived practice. So that's why in sociocracy, we aim to have the people who are a member of a circle be the people who are operationally involved. Those who work together make decisions. It doesn't say those who have opinions make decisions. Big difference. So that makes it much less likely that that scenario even comes up. It's already structurally not set up in a way that that would happen. That said, no, it's, it, it's, no, it's actually a non-starter. This, this simply doesn't happen. It could happen if somebody is new to the circle and so on, and then you find something around that. The question is more, what happens if people are upset about the decision that another circle made and they were under-informed? And then it becomes a matter of how well did the circle communicate before they made a decision? And that is, that's something that comes with the system. It's kind of the Spider-Man principle. With a lot of power comes a lot of responsibility. If we give you the power to make all the decisions about this or that, we expect you to also ask us for feedback that goes together. And with that, it's really not an issue. 
So I believe the person who asked the question, Claudia, um, you raised your hand. Do you want to elaborate on your question or? Did... Yes, thank you. Yeah, because, um, okay. This is a, a person actually really talented, but very young and new and um, has really good points of things to consider, but one doesn't understand the material because they didn't even get what the top line was. And the other thing is that they're, well, this is conventional. And I'm like, well, we don't want conventional. We want we want to solve the problem and we want to be innovative. And that the, so the challenge is kind of approach. You know, it's like you have somebody's trying to do the right thing, but not really armed to do it. So there's a lot of mentoring and then getting the person to open their mind. Um, so I, I think like in concept, these are nice. Like, I think it's really excellent what, what's being proposed, but, you know, I think this is very common that people, everyone has opinions, right? We all have opinions. So I guess that's why it's, it's really managing with these subtleties of challenge. So that's, that's why I wanted to give a little more context. And also, you know, I think that's common. I work with a lot of people like that, you know, so thank you. Well, Yes, thank you. They're different. Let me just show you the variety of responses that one could give here with more context. Um, because in my experience, you know, all of these things are interrelated. That's the issue. So if I walk into an organization as a consultant, I know that probably there's not one problem to solve, right? There's always a bunch that are somehow interrelated. So here, for example, I would hear some questions I would ask, and I don't. We don't necessarily need the answers now, just so that you get an idea. I would ask, why is that person? And I still have the question of why is that person in the circle? If they are doing work with you, they don't sound like the quality to do qualified to do the work if they don't actually understand the things. So why is that person in the circle in the first place? Second question: um, Have you brought up the feedback and talked about how how can we manage you know with our different like styles or whatever? Second, and third, has there been enough context set on a higher level or on this level about basic um, approaches, I, maybe even values, I'm not a big fan of that, but basic strategies, mental models, and so on, so that you have more that holds you together that is already agreed upon. Like that's where I would go. So how can you create more context with each other so those um, left field kind of things aren't as, as uh, relevant, not as common. And the last one I'm going to mention is um, the things that you mentioned are kind of good examples to tease apart around, is that an objection? Because this is not conventional. I would, as a facilitator, would say, okay, how does that manifest? Like, to me, that's not an argument yet. You know, I want to know, like, what, okay, what is your worry? Okay, let's mitigate the worry. Let's just not say, a, like, a blanket no. You know, like, what is the actual issue? And then, so one has to drill deeper instead of kind of staying on the surface, which typically happens in the objections process. So there's a lot more. But again, all of these things, you know, in a way, one has to tighten all the screws if one walks into an organization, tighten all of them and just see which ones are the most that need tightening first. But I wanna, yeah, anyway, I'm gonna pause. I'm yeah. quiet. I'll, I'll hand it to uh, Joss, who's here from Systems Innovation Network. You Thanks, Ben, yeah. Hi, um, Ted, great to have you joining. Thanks for the presentation. I think Anya mentioned we're introducing soc sociocracy uh, into our organization, maybe not the official form, but as we understand it. Um, and one of the key parts I think about in this term of organization is the idea of abstraction. I don't know if you talk about that much in, in sociocracy, that the more abstract circles, like the general circle, are kind of setting the stage for the smaller circles that are nested within that. And um, and then there's questions about governance, which is what I wanted to ask. Um, say you give that example of the finance circle um, in your organization or you're talking about the people who are changing the pricing on their flower pots um so imagine that's a decision that group is making that actually affects everyone else all the gardeners right and everybody else disagrees with that how does that work in terms of governance can the can those disputes be risen to the general circle to the higher level and then negotiated there and they can actually impose some rule back onto that circle um and even you know um 
one-to-one -one disputes that happen in that circle. Can that be surfaced to the governance circle? We, we call it our kind of governance and strategy, I guess it's a, your uh, general circle. And I was just wondering about how that relationship works. Yes. Um, let's see, hold on, I forgot the first part. Wait, 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 I almost have it again. So yes, what if a decision, yeah, can you can can you escalate something up? That's that's where I want to jump in. Um, yes, you can, but I would separate the issue. I would try, so because I'm not a big fan of escalating, like let's say a circle is trying to solve an issue, can't figure it out and just bumps it up whenever. You can in theory do that, but my experience is that it doesn't, it, tends to not help the issue because then you have a whole set of new people having to work their way into it and so on. It's just, it just, yeah. So that, and typically the, the systemic, um, yeah, tensions don't disappear from just bumping it up. So typically they can't do anything about it either. So it doesn't, it's anyway, but now what they, what I would do is separate, kind of identify what is the thing that needs clarified on a higher level so we can make this decision here. That's the question to ask for me. So where do we, or what is it that we, yeah, that we don't have enough clarity on? So for example, Let's say, I'll use an example for my domain here. Let's say we constantly argue about should there be a, should there be scholarships for, I don't know, events, you know, should we give out free tickets? And let's say trainings or whatever, webinar circle always argues about that. Now we don't send the question of, of ticketing. We send that question stays here, but we ask, can we please get a more coherent guideline on a higher level, more abstract, as you said, that would set the stage so this decision is easy to make. But that it has, if you bump it up, the, that higher frame has to be in that domain. Otherwise, otherwise they also can't make a decision. So you need to set up the domains to have the more abstracted levels correctly represented in the domains. Otherwise you, you're just sending it into Nirvana in a way. Does it make sense? And does that answer your does it speak to yeah, what you want? Yeah, it does make sense. I was just wondering how much kind of protocols you have developed around that whole governance framework and all of that stuff, because as you know, it's just not totally clear about what should stay there and what should go up and yes. how that works. And... Yeah, and one thing, just because I'm sensitive to it, sorry, there's just one little warning, and that is, so there's, um, because the different ways of this, using the word governance, and I think that sometimes where groups struggle, the way I... Uh, mm, I'm going to use a different term. To me, basically everything is policies, right? Everything are agreements that we make, both about how we work, which is our governance, and then about things about, about our work, about the content of our work. Um, sometimes people have this view of, you know, governance is this, um, like the highest level decisions are made somewhere high up, and that's not necessarily given in sociocracy. You know, like the payment structure was made in a sub, sub, sub circle. That's a high level decision, I would say. And yet it was so... It's sometimes a little counterintuitive at first about where these decisions, like where domains live and how abstract they might be. But yeah, that's probably a deeper conversation. I just wanted to watch out about that governance versus policy distinction. It's not as trivial. I think it needs more sitting down because um, because I think what's baked into people's thinking is that separation that I showed, showed on the first slide of some people set the frame and some people carry out in that frame. And I, I think that's too simple of a story. So, and I know that's still in our heads somehow. So just right. watching about that. Okay, where are we here? Yes, we still have quite a few questions. Um, I'll let you uh, choose a question that you... See. Oh, sorry. Did you sorry? Did you want to feed me one because I'm not quite fast enough to. Oh, okay. Um. Otherwise, I'll I'll bring up the next one. I'm going top down, but there are so many great questions. I'm not sure if we have enough time to answer all. But um, one of them was um, what is the max um kind of organizational uh um capacity? What how? What is the max uh, basically um where one can implement sociocracy? That's we don't know that yet. So far, we have not hit a limit yet. I can tell you the biggest organization that I'm aware of is several hundred thousand people. We just don't know about it. I mean, we, you know, it's not as well known as it should be. 
because of the nature of the project, it's the Neighborhood and Children's Parliaments in India. Amazing project, worth looking up. But they use consent and linked circles and the sociocratic selection process. And they are several hundred thousands of people. But there's very little task interdependence. So it's I think with higher task interdependence, it would be maybe a little different. You know, because they're kind of organized by neighborhoods. And yeah, anyway, it's a different story. So again, it depends on the nature of size. If it's just having more circles in more places doing very different things, I don't think there's an issue because everything will nest. But there are some different stories where I worry a little bit more. Um, and the next question is, does a circle prevent information asymmetry within or accentuates it among those outside that specific circle from Sanjay? So, sorry, is the question whether there's going to be information asymmetry because now more information is in the circle than outside of it? Is that where this is going? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that is even by design. Yes, that's, that's, and in, so to the extent that we even say if somebody reports to or from a circle, please think about what you can leave out, but also think about what you need to amplify because it might be some indicator of a bigger pattern that might be noticeable if you now bring this thing. And that, of course, I mean, you know, system, I don't have to explain that to the systems thinkers that that is all, a, you know, an educated guess and just a guess and all of that. But no, the idea is to reduce the number of, of information that everybody has to hold. So and then the asymmetry, I mean, I'm not even sure, I guess, yeah, that is a descriptive enough term. I, it can be an issue if people have the expectation that they can have, again, again, goes to the question of opinions. Like yesterday, for example, in my in my community, we approved the budget um, in a in a large group, and it was just barely so that we could do it because it's actually hard to understand all the circles. You know, like where why do they ask for this? And there's always a story and that you don't know and so on. So complexity adds up quite fast. So I'm glad that it filters it out. I'll stop here. There's more to say, but I won't. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess we have just one more question, I guess. Um, so uh, do you need to have roughly the same number of people in each circle? No. Whatever serves the domain. So for example, if you have, um, if you have, what's a good example? Let's say you have the gardening circle, you might have 15 people in it because these are all gardeners that want to talk about the garden. And if you have what, I don't know, finance circle or IT circle, maybe it's three people. I wouldn't, ironically, the more complex the issue, the smaller I would keep the circle because it's harder to hold a lot of nuances with 15 people. And then I would switch into approach where we get feedback and have a smaller group discussing it. So there's always, yeah. It's that. 11 hours. I'm putting my, I'm putting my email in the chat just for those who might have to leave and might want to say or ask something. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, we're uh, towards the end of our event. So thank you everyone for joining and for so like such great um, questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to cover all, but it was very insightful. I hope that um, everyone gained um, a lot from this session. And I just sent various links into the chat, um, some leading to Sociocracy for All, the website,